Okay, so welcome back to the second semester. Okay, we will be, uh, the first hour I will spend on some boring stuff. I mean, this is mainly, this will be a review of how we will carry out the course. I mean, I think all of you have taken at least one course from me at either 109 or 1010. Is there anybody here who didn't attend any of my lectures, 109 or 1010? Okay, you, well, at least we should inform your friend. This is me, my name, my office. All of this, this, this slide will go on to uh, optic class so that if you, uh, you can just check this information also from the next class. You don't have to write it down. Now that's it. Okay. Now I suppose you can hear me. Okay. This semester we will be mainly studying electricity, a familiar uh, uh, phenomenon that you are probably all familiar with. I'm sure all of you have gotten shocked at least once from some source of static electricity. Okay, your friend hasn't got any shock from static electricity. Now the, the book will be the same book. We will just continue, start from chapter 21. And we will be, first we will start with the simple case of static charges. Those are charges that are not moving. Electric charge, electric field. Now, the, these are each one of these is mainly one chapter in your book, <laughs> and then we will go on to study what happens if the charges are themselves moving, not at rest, and then we will see that there's the, a new phenomenon appears, the magnetism. So we end up having uh, mag. We will study magnets, how the magnetic field is created, and how we can create the, this uh, electromagnetic induction is basically how we create electricity. The electricity that we are using here is basically created using electromagnetic induction. And then we will study the circuits and eventually we will have the accelerated charges. Uh, we, in the first semester we had already studied the motion. We know that the objects can be at rest, they can be moving at constant velocity, or they can be moving with varying velocity. And this is the last subject, what happens when the charges are being accelerated. And there we will see that the light that we see, I mean, that enlights us, is mainly uh, created by accelerated charges. And when you use the radio, or even when you can hear me, you can uh, hear me because of this microphone, but this microphone basically works without any wires because of the phenomenon, because due to the accelerated charges in the, in the circuit. And we also have the additional materials. We have the, the book by Ohanian, then the, there's the Feynman lectures, which I do strongly advise you to read. And there is the other materials from the MIT Open Course. Well, this, well, this was Walter Levin. Levin. Uh, you, have you watched the Walter Levin videos? Unfortunately, they are all remo removed from the open courseware and from your labs, I can tell that you know why they were removed. But still, there is the Turkish translations are still available on the web from this website. Yes, this, this site. Also, in the Made to Open courseware, you can find many sources not necessarily related with this subject, but also with any other subject that you are interested in. And of course, the library has lots and lots of sources that, you, that might uh, help you. Another thing for this semester <coughs> is, uh, the, at least in the last semester for the mechanics 109, you could have found some recorded lectures of the mechanics courses, but not for the electromagnetics courses. And the uh, video recordings of this course is being recorded. We have a camera at the back. And all the lectures will be recorded and it will be put online as soon as possible so that if you would like to uh, go over the lecture material, you will be able to do that. Don't worry. You will be uh, shy from the camera for a couple of hours. After that, you will forget that he is over there. That is my experience. Okay, there is the grades, just as the previous term. <coughs> We, have the, we will have two midterms. Each one will contribute 25% to your final grade. There is a final exam. You will get regular homeworks more or less every week. 
and then there will be the pop quizzes, plus there will be the translation bonus. And last semester, since I was not remembering it correctly, I had given you too e the bonus too easily. Now, this semester, you have to translate 30 pages, at least five items. If you have one item that is 30 pages, just choose four more, more very small items. So it, it will, you will complete 30 pages, 30, five items. Now, the pop quizzes, well, your friends already know. I, I don't take attendance but I make just quizzes, very short quizzes uh, <coughs> during the class, and if you don't attend the quizzes, you, you will not be able to take the final exam. And there you will have homeworks, the final exam. Well, these are the conditions for the final exam. There are the pop quizzes, there is the pre-reports, and if you miss any of the midterms without any excuse, you will not be able to take the final. Well, you, you can just read over these. Well, there's a frequently asked questions now on the class, and let me show you where it is so you will not tell me that you didn't see it. So if you just, this is Ot your Otto class account, this is more or less what you will see. If you open this news forum, you have here, there is a frequently asked questions, which starts with, when are the translations due? So just before sending me an email, read over these uh, frequently asked questions. I think I have included all the common questions, but I might have forgotten some. So if you send me, if you don't find your answer here, you send me an email, I, will, I might keep updating this list. So check it regularly. Now the pre-reports, again, it will, they will be more or less one page, half a page review, half a page your questions. Well, these are the 10 ways to annoy a college professor, which we had already gone through next semester. So I will not go over them. You can read them. And okay, by the way, some of you were asking what happened to our exams, the, the exams that we took at the beginning of the last semester and at the end of the last semester. So this is basically the histogram, the blue, is what you did on the first exam. <laughs> and the red is what you did at the end of the semester exam. The blue is so-called the pre-test, and the red is so-called the post-test. And the change is, well, the mean of the pre-test was just 11.48, and the post-test is 15.94, is more or less a four points increase. Now, the, this ratio is kind of interesting. So if you look at this ratio, th this is what you, 30 minus pre is the number of questions that you didn't answer correctly. So in principle, you could have learned as much as 30, min 30 minus your pre-test result. And this is how much you have learned. This is the difference between the post-test and the pre-test. And this is how much you have learned. And if you just put in these, the averages rather than uh, person by person averages, you get 24%. You have learned 24% of what you could have learned. Now, don't take, don't take this as a measure of your success. This is a measure of my success. Now, it, what is this number? There, there are researchers uh, on this average. There are thousands of such tests made in the US, not many in Turkey. And the average is 22%. In any university, if you look at, there are thousands of universities like the Harvard, from the Harvard, MIT, or to, to the worst state universities, and in all of them, the students <coughs> just learn 22, around 22%. The variation is very small. The, it goes from something like 20% 20 to 24%, 20% 20 to 24, 25%. The, it's quite pre, it's a quite a precise measurement, and uh, it's just 22 percent. Well, the conclusion that many people drive from this number, uh, in in that sense, we are just a typical group. And the conclusion that they drive from this number is that the lecturing just doesn't work. I mean, whatever whatever I do, you might have some fun time here, or you might be bored here. That, that will depend on what I do, but what you learn will be kind of independent of that. 
So that's mainly the, I mean, they have already made many analyses. They had studied these thousands of uh, classes into groups that are very small, groups that are very big, groups whose professors get teaching awards and groups that whose professors score the lowest in you. Remember your, these pink forms that you fill at the end? And they all have 22%. Well, one reason why this fails, they say that it is, why it's only 22% when you, I mean, you only learn 22% of all the things that you cannot, you could have learned. They say that it is the student participation. The more the students participate in the class, the more they learn. Of course, it's not so easy in large classrooms. So we had, I mean, if you remember, we did try to use it a few times. We had this, I had this question, you send your replies with through SMS, which didn't work, so I didn't bother uh, trying it again. Now, it is one of the systems that people have developed <coughs> to make sure that the students participate. Because, you see, if you remember what the lecture that we had in the last semester, Okay, I was asking questions, I was encourage, trying to encourage you to participate, but it was kind of 10, 15 people who are really participating. Right? Yes or no? How many people were actively participating in the discussions? So nobody, nobody thinks that you have participated in the discussions? Come on. I, I think more of you participated in the discussions. Anyway, the problem is the stud I mean, there were around 100, 120 students participating in the class, but only 10, 10 15 percent really actually participated in the class. But if you think of it, I mean, if you have 100 students, and if every student asks a question or replies, it takes around, let's say, 30 seconds, so that makes one hour. So. It's, it's not even practical if everybody really says, some, says something. So this is an alternative where, I mean, I, I did use it last year. We couldn't manage to get it working last semester, but last year I did use it, and there were like 70, 80 answers. So that, that's nice. I mean, at least 70, 80 people did give an answer and get the correct answer, and we discussed the correct answer at the end. And Well, this semester I will be trying to get this working. And the performance last semester was, I mean, this last semester it was 25%, but the same number last year was 38%. So that is the main difference in my lecturing, at least, between last year and last semester. Last year I used this SMS system, last semester I didn't use it. So it seems to be really making a difference. So we will try to implement it. And I will ask you to try to contribute more. OK, so any questions about the course, how we will be doing this, carrying out this course, et cetera? OK. Hmm? Now, this is basic. I mean, especially our friends with long straight hair will be quite familiar with this such uh, scenes, right? Well, let me close some lights. Now, of course, there is this machine over there, but even without that machine, in, in a dry uh, day, if you, just, if you just comb your hair, your hair looks more or less like this if you have straight long hair. Hmm? Now, suppose you don't know about anything about electricity. You are living in the time of Newton. You know dynamics, you know Newton's laws. What can you say about the forces here? Okay, there is a, okay, if you just take one hair piece over there, one hair string, there is a gravitational force, that's for sure. It will be pulling it downwards. 
There will be a detention. Let's just imagine that we just look at this bit of the hair. So there is the gravitational force there is in this direction. There is a tension force in this direction. So the net, for, net, force, net uh, force resulting from the gravitational force and the tension force, can it be zero? But this piece of hair is not moving. But we, we know from Newton's time that if something is not moving, it's not accelerating, it means that there is no net force acting on it. But we just said that there is the gravitational force, there is the tension force, and hence there is some net force. So unless there is some third force acting on it. So this is one hint that we know that there is some, some other kind of forces acting here. I mean, you can create such effects even without that. This machine over there, I mean, even if you don't have straight long hair, you can. I, I'm hope that you you are combing your hair every day, right? And if you comb your hair, if you just take a small piece of paper, and you will see that there is no force. <laughs> Let's see. Let's say you are combing your hair. <laughs> okay. I just tested before coming here. It did work. Okay. Huh? Hmm? Does it work with this one? It's probably something wrong with me. <laughs> now we are experiment. Hmm? That is the point. Hmm? This doesn't work. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so now we had made some experiments. What did we learn? Well, this, this piece of paper at least, okay, it was just sitting on the table. And then when I approached the thing, nothing happened. So. Why should anything happen anyway? We robbed it, and nothing happened. We robbed it f f uh, faster, nothing happened. And then we took some other equipment, we changed our equipment, nothing happened. We changed the cloth, something happened. So now, there's some force. So let's see. So this is the table. On it there was this piece of paper. And what we did was we approached something. And this paper, this piece of paper would lift it up. So again, there's some force over there. There should be some force. Now, if you are a physicist, if you want to try this phenomena, what you do is you take many substances like this one, like the pencil or, or pen, you, and you take this cloth, the hair, or anything you imagine. You just rub them, and you just try to find if there are forces acting on it. And what, what happens? Is it always attractive? Is it repulsive? How does it change with distance? How does it change depending on the material? How does it change if you just rub it on, I don't know, on wood, on a piece of cloth like this, or on that cloth? What changes? All right. 
And suppose that you do this, uh, these experiments, and you realize that you can devise a, a simple device. So you take a sp spherical ball, attach a copper to it, you put this thing in a jar, which is isolated, And at the end of this copper, you attach two very thin aluminum leaves. And what you do? You just take this thing, you rub it, and when it, when it lifts this paper, if you bring it close to here, you will see that the lids just go up. This is another experiment that you do. If you remo remove this one, the lids just go down. So you can say that, okay, there is some force due to this object acting on these foils. Remember, the foils are further away. It's not, I mean, it's not like this uh, piece of paper. I mean, the piece of paper, the ball is very close to the paper. But here, no, it's not close to the paper. But even if it is not close to the paper, if you put some copper over here, it will influence this one. But if you put some wood, it will have no effect. So then you make this distinction. For some materials, you have this effect that when you approach this ball after rubbing it on a suitable cloth, if you bring it close to this sphere, then these uh, aluminum lids <coughs> will open up. For some other materials, when you put it over here, nothing will happen to the aluminum lids. So this, this allows you to classify materials that you see around you. Not all of them behave the same way with respect to this effect, whatever that is. Then you, have, you make <coughs> other experiments. But you bring this sphere over here, touch it with your finger, Then remove your finger. After removing your finger, when you touch, okay, you bring the ball to this electroscope. The aluminum lids open. When you touch it, the aluminum foils they will close down. And when you remove this ball, they will just open up again. So this is what you you will see. You have this setup. You bring the ball, the ball is over there, you touch it with your finger, and then the leads, they just close down. Then you remove your finger, so this is still the, se the same setup. Your finger is gone, they close down. Then you remove the ball. And the lids open up. <coughs> then they open up. So somehow before, <coughs> without touching the thing with the finger, the foils were closed down. Now before touching with the finger, the lids were open. This because the ball is close by, you touch it with your finger, and then <coughs> the lids are open, and then you touch it again. Uh, you touch the finger, the, the foils close, then you remove the ball, the foils open up. So you have this, this is called the electroscope. with the foils up. And you keep on doing your experiments, and a f you realize a funny th another funny thing. You take one ball, you rub it on some material, you bring it closer, and the foils, they close down. Now this is what would you would expect from here, if you just, you bring the ball, the foils are up, 
you touch with your finger, the foils close down. You remove your fingers, the foils are still closed. And then you remove the ball, the foils open up. You bring the ball back, the foils will close down. So if the foils are up, separated, bringing this ball will just close them up. But then you take another material, not this ball, but let's say in this pen. You rub the pen, you bring it close, and this time what happens is the foils, instead of closing down, they open up further. So what can you say about from this observation about this phenomena? They, are they all the same? There are at least two different kinds. So we have this opened up foils. You bring one material, which is prepared in a, by rubbing it to some, material, some other substance, and it causes the foils to close down. And you have another material which you prepare by rubbing some other substance to some other cloth, and it causes the foils to move up. So at least we know that there are two different kinds of this, whatever causes this. How to name them? Why? Hmm? I mean, you can name them A, B. There is nothing wrong with that. Or you can name them hmm? A, A, B, or Sarjan and Sarjan Prime. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just give whichever name you want. Of course, <coughs> this phenomena is creates some force because it is creating this motion. And we know from Newton's time that if something is creating motion, it can only do it by creating some force. Now the question is, what is that force? How that, and we already know that there are two different sources of that force. One will cause the, these foils to move up, the other one will cause it to close down. I mean, similar experiments didn't, real, re, uh, didn't uh, create a third type of force, at least in electromagnetism that we will be studying this semester, we know that there are only two types of charges. There is no third charge. We know in nature that there are forces in which there are six different types of charges. For example, the nuclear forces. One of the nuclear forces have uh, four different charges. Another nuclear force has six different charges. So in that case, it doesn't make sense to call them plus or minus. We are not even calling them plus or minus. Only in this case, since we have only two of them, we just call them plus and minus. Now, okay, so we have this effect, which creates a force. Now we have to study the force. Now, of course, you can just do this experiment of rubbing some material on a cloth, and one thing you would realize is the more you rub, I mean, if you just rub it once, there's a very small effect. If you rub it twice, the effect is larger. If you rub it more times, you will see a larger effect. So somehow, this rubbing motion is creating a larger influence. Okay, then in this experiments with the electroscope, we have seen, okay, there are two different charges. Secondly, there are materials which uh, transfer this effect. For example, if you put in the electroscope, if you put here wood, independent of which, char which uh, ball or which thing you bring, the foils will feel no effect whatsoever. But if you put some copper here, then we know that if you bring one ball, these this, uh, aluminum foils, they will open up or close down, depending on the kind of charge you have. So this is, in a sense, the copper carries this effect, whatever that is, 
we will call it electricity. Copper carries this effect, but wood doesn't. By the way, did any one of you see an electron? Yes. No? No, TV is not an electron. Hmm? Let me show you an electron. This is a real electron. <laughs> not these ones, this one. Okay, so these ones are the real electrons. Now, because in the first times of these experiments, people used amber to generate this electricity. I mean, they didn't rub it on cloth, they, they just used a piece of amber. So the effect, they called it amber effect. Amber in Greek just means electron. So we have the, the electron and electricity. Electricity probably means related with amber. So you have seen that amber. Is anybody wearing a piece of amber? Yes, your friend has some electrons. Well, all of you are having millions of electrons, but your friend has the real one. Now, and then, of course, there are these materials which transfer this effect. Let us call them conductors. These are the materials that transfer this effect, like the copper. And then we have the insulators. These are the things that do not transfer this effect, like the wood is an insulator. Your finger is affecting the electroscope. Well, that mainly tells us that your body is, uh, to an extent, a conductor. It's not an insulator. So now we have the, condu the conductors. The, these, uh, we know the conductors. Now, we will say that when you just rub the piece of material, uh, when you are rubbing this thing, on another piece of material, creating these effects, we will be calling it charging. Let's say to charge. So effectively by rubbing a piece of cloth on a piece of amber or rubbing any plastic on some cloth, you are charging the, your uh, amber or your plastic, which creates this uh, electricity, electronic effect. Now, let's do some more experiments with our <coughs> electroscope. Let's say that you have your electroscope over here. Initially, it's closed. Then you have this charged object. You bring it. If you bring it, it will open up the foils. Then what you do is you just bring this object. Let's say that you manage to charge a conductor. Let's assume that you make this sphere with a conductor, but then you have to be careful not to touch the conductor if you want to see this effect. You have this conductor, you rub it with a piece of cloth, a piece of silk, let's say, then you will be charging it, but you shouldn't touch it. And then you bring another sphere, identical sphere, Okay, you bring an identical sphere. This is like, these are two identical. And then you just put a conductor between the two. This is A, this is B. 
and you just remove the conductor afterwards. So this is A. Let's say with A in the near vicinity, these open up to here. But now you bring B. So what do you expect? Hmm? Now, if we would bring A, they will open this much. Now, then we bring B. Without the A, I mean, we bring A, it opens this much, we can measure the thing. Now we bring B, without the A, it will open only here. Now by the opening angle, you can already determine the force, because you know the, the weight of the object, and it comes to equilibrium at, the, at some point. So at least you know how much torque this uh, new force has to create to make sure that the, the foil stop here. Now we had this A, or initially A, so they op the foils open up to this much, they open a lot, meaning that the force was large. But when we just put A and B in contact through a conductor, we see that the B Although before it didn't create any effect, now it does create some effect. But the effect is smaller than what A used to be, used to create. Now if you bring A again, after putting it in contact with B, it will again create, the effect that A will create will be identical to the effect that B will create, and both will be smaller. Now we, now we know that we can describe this phenomenon as saying that, okay, when we were rubbing the uh, conductor by some cloth, we were charging it, but once we charge it, by putting it in contact with an object B, uh, another con uh, conductor B, some of the charge has moved to B. Now also when you are thinking about electricity and these things, remember that these were times when people didn't really know about the atoms. They, they have no clue about the electron. They don't know electrons, they don't know atoms. And there is this weird phenomena, which kind of the, the thing that creates this weird phenomena can be transferred from one object to another object by some materials that they call conductors. Now, the initially people just thought that it was kind of a fluid flow flowing from one material to the other one. So we know that they can go from one to the other one. Just imagine you, you even don't have any measuring device of this quantity except on this one. This is your electroscope, but you can just think that this opening angle gives you a measure of how much charge you have in each material. But of course, this distance also affects how much they open up. Then you have to do the experiment. How much does this force change as the charge is changing? and as the <coughs> distance is changing. Now, this experiment already, already tells you how to divide a given amount of charge. So we already know that if we have a charged object, an initially charged object, it contains some amount of charge. We don't know how much. We don't know how to quantify it, but some amount of charge. By putting it in contact with an identical second object, we know that we are dividing the charge. There is no reason for the charge on this object to be more than the charge on the other object or vice versa because these two are identical. So we know how to divide. We don't, know, we don't yet know how to measure charges, but we know how to divide the charges equally. Just charge one object, take an uh, identical object, bring them in contact, and then both of them will have half the charge. So this is, this is basically how you, how you do it. You start with an object. This is your initial object. Let's say it has, we don't know how to measure it, but it has a charge, let's say Q. Then you bring another object. 
and put it in contact with it, identical one. Well, since they are identical, there is no reason for the charge to prefer one over the other one, so it will just divide equally. So here, this will have q over 2, this will have q over 2. And then you have an object with charge q over 2, you have this other one, you bring a third one, so they will divide q over 4, q over 4, etc. If you have a given charge, you can obtain some fraction of that charge by just bringing identical objects together. So this, although you don't know what Q is, you can just divide it by two. Then you can think about measuring the forces. So imagine you have, how do you measure the forces? Now we know that if we touch these objects, they lose their effect. Remember, in the electroscope, when we touched the electroscope uh, sphere, we did change the system. We don't want to change the system, so we shouldn't be touching them. How do you measure the forces? Well, last semester we had already studied the forces. <laughs> Give me an experiment. So th that's the question. Gravitational interaction. Okay, how will I, uh, let's say, I want the force that two charged objects are exerting on each other. That is the force I would like to find. So how can I devise a setup which will tell me how much force this, these charged objects will exert in, on each other? Springs. I mean, be more specific. How? What's the process? What kind of a system do you imagine? Hmm? Okay. Okay, so what you are saying is, let's say we have one spring and we attach some charge Q and another spring we attach a charge Q prime, and then we measure how much uh, these things will contract or elongate. That's another idea. So you can just take two strings, attach the charges on top of them. Of course, if there are any force that these two charges are exerting on each other, they will move towards each other or away from each other. So from this, ang this deviation angle, if any, from theta or theta prime, you can measure the force. So at least there we have means of measuring the force. The mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, both of them will work. Both of them will, will work if you do it them properly. I would rather go for the second one. Because in the case of the springs, most of the springs are made up of conductors. They will conduct electricity, it will complicate the, your life and you have to make sure that they, I mean, to make an easy measurement, you have to make sure that they will be all on a, on a single line, which means you have to put some other stuff around to, to make sure that the springs do not move to the left or to the right. But this one would be easier for me. So we know how to measure. So let's say given Q and Q, we measure a force F. Given Q and given Q over 2 and Q over 2, we already know how to divide the forces. Let's say we measure F prime. S and suppose that we just use this system. Now we have these strings 
at the end we have these masses and by measuring the deviations of the strings we are measuring the force so that these mass these two charges are exerting on each other so okay so you already know some electricity some static electricity how is f prime the mag uh, the here i'm only talking about the magnitudes how is f prime and f will be related how they will be related i mean if i have two q's i measure some force let i'm calling it f or f0 if i reduce the charges in half the force that i will measure F0 over 4. F0 over 4, well, it will be less than F0 over 4. Or, sorry, larger than F0 over 4. This is what you will measure if you use any of these setups in the way that has been just described because there is something wrong in these setups. Well, you see, the force changes, we know that the force changes due to two things. One is the charge. The second one is the distance. So in the case of the electroscope, by uh, uh, moving the ball closer or further away from the electroscope, you can uh, uh, observe that the foils will uh, split further or they will just close up. So the distance is a factor. So if you want to measure how the charges affect the force, you have to make sure that the distances are always kept the same. Now, How can you do that? How, how should you modify these experiments so that the distance will be kept constant? Now, what I, we want to do, study first, we know we have already seen in the case of the electroscope is that there is a quantity called that we will name charge that affects this force. Another thing that affects this force is the distance. So there are two things that we have to study. One, the effect of the force, the effect of the distance on this force, and the other one is the effect of the charges on this force. We already know how to divide the charges. If we have a given charge, we can take the half of it, one-fourth of it, one-eighth of it. So we, we already have different charges. At least the ratios are, will be fixed. But we have to keep the distance constant. If, if you want to study the effect of the charge, you have to keep the distance constant. Yes? How? That's the question. Okay. But the distance will be different if you just do it in this setup. You have to do one more thing to make sure that the distance are the same. You see, what, what you will see is if you put some charges Q, Q and Q over there, you will see that they're open like this. So this is the distance between the two. If you have the charges, you will see that they will all be open like this. So the distance is less. But then you have to move the suspension points further away. So you have to make sure that as you reduce Q, you have to move these suspension points such that the distance will be the same as you change the charge. Now, for the, a constant distance, you can measure the dis the, this angle over here. From that angle, for a constant distance, you can determine the force. And that force will be equal to F0 over 4, if you keep the distances constant. 
Well, you can do these experiments for different, very different charges. You can take Q and Q over two. This will give you F double prime. This is F zero over two and Q and Q over four. F prime is equal to F triple prime F zero over four, etc. So this already will tell you this much measurement that the, the force is proportional to the charge of this one. You can just chain the charge of the other one. So the force, the magnitude of the force is proportional to Q times Q prime. This is one thing that you can already determine by repeating the, that experiment. Of course, again, there's another thing that you have to make sure. Well, we know how to divide a given charge, but we have to make sure that we start from the same charge. So how do you prepare the first charge Q? That's, all, that will, that's also something you have to pay attention to if you are actually doing this experiment. You have to first establish some procedure to generate the charge at a given humidity with using specific materials, rubbing uh, I don't know how many times with such and such a force. So if you make sure that your initial preparation is identical, you can just assume that you have the same charge at the end of that procedure. And then by dividing that charge, you can just carry out all these experiments. And then you can establish that the force will be proportional to the charges, the product of the charges. Well, then you have to study the distance. How does it change with the distance? Well, again, you have to make measurements with various distances, and you will show that the force is proportional to, we already know that it is Q times Q prime divided by the distance squared. So this you can establish by just making some experiments. Now, of course, we have some modern devices now. We know that this 2, let's say d to the n, n is 2 plus minus 1 times 10 to power minus 16, I think. So it is almost exactly 2. Within our experimental limits, it's exactly 2. Now let's give a break now. We are already late. I mean, any questions before you go for a break? Okay, see you after 10 minutes.